Hello everyone, and welcome to CK Med. My name is Clark, and I'll be taking you through Lower Limb today. To start things off, um, I want to emphasize regional studying. When we did upper limb, we wanted to talk about our muscles, our nerves, our blood, and our venous and lymph drainage that came from our upper limb. So we're going to try to apply that same concept when we're studying our lower limb, uh, and our lower limb is quite a bit easier than our upper limb. Uh, we do have our lumbar plexus, but that's not as complex, and you don't really need to know that much that comes from our lumbar plexus as much as you did for our brachial plexus. Your hands are more important than your legs, just so you know. But as far as our muscles, um, the muscles of our thigh and our uh, hip are nicely kind of knit together, and we can really emphasize them based on compartments. And so when we're dealing with the compartments of the thigh, there are four compartments, our anterior, our posterior, our lateral, and our medial. And we're gonna organize them just accordingly. And so we're gonna kind of spin around the leg. We're gonna do our anterior, then our medial, then our posterior, and our lateral uh, associatively. So uh, here are the muscles of the thigh and our anterior compartment, our anterior compartment of our thigh. Uh, also, you must remember that you have some that come from the abdomen that come down for your hip. The thigh is not only important for thigh muscles, but it's also important for your knee joint and your hip joint. Some of the muscles that cross over each of these are the ones that we really need to know. So the ones that cross over the hip joint are going to be the ones that come from your abdomen, which is your iliacus muscle here, and your psoas muscle, which is found up here. Uh, always remember your psoas. It's the most important muscle that ever gets tested on imaging, uh, and most important muscle that gets tested on clinical vignettes. Uh, it's associated with appendicitis or tuberculosis, and then they have pain that radiates down into their leg. Um, that's our psoas muscle, uh, our psoas major muscle that comes into play there. And those go together and make a very small kind of knit fibered muscle called your iliopsoas. Um, and then uh, we have from our ASIS, the point um, anterior superior uh, iliac spine, we have an attachment of muscle that kind of goes all the way across like a nice seat belt and then ends up in your pes anserinus, um, which is for your goose's foot. Um, and um, that is uh, your sartorius muscle. It's the one that crosses from lateral and goes medially as you go down distally this way. And then we have our rectus muscles, and this is your quad muscles. These are the ones you work out with your quad machine at the gym, and those are made up of four parts. Our rectus femoris, our vastus medialis, lateralis, um, and your sartorius also helps out there as well. Um, and so our rectus muscles, the main three ones are these guys, and then our sartorius overlies. Those are the ones that you work out with that machine. And then lastly, we have this kind of medial one, uh, very small little square thing, that's your pectineus. That's important for your adduction of your, um, a little bit of adduction in addition to a little bit of flexion of your hip. And those are your only ones in your anterior compartment. Now we have some of the, la um, the uh, medial compartment uh, that also we have one that crosses over. Our pectineus crosses over here and allows not only for flexion of the hip, but also for some adduction. And so our medial compart are your adductors. And that's why we call their adductor brevis, adductor longus, adductor magnus. And then we have that one uh, muscle that gets really used with that very graceful machine. If you can think of that at the gym, the one that, you know, all the ladies love, um, watching guys do you know as they're winking at him like what's up ladies as they're working out their medial thighs uh, if you can remember that little squeezing uh, workout machine that's a very graceful machine and so it works out your gracilis um, and so that's the muscle that's found there and that's the one i always remember as far as your medial compartment in addition to all the ones called adductors and that uh this area of our um these area two areas of our um, of our thigh are innervated by a nice chunked nerve. Uh, from the anterior compartments, your femoral, femoral nerve controls all those motors. And then from your adductor compartment or your medial compartment, that's gonna be your obturator nerve. Um, and those are nice, uh, easily remembered areas there. And then on the back side of the leg 
is going to be our posterior compartment. So we already talked about some of the adductor magnus and stuff like that, but we have muscles that are kind of your hamstrings. So these are the ones that you strain more than anything else for some weird reason, but these are very strange muscles. So we have two that are on the medial side and we have uh, some on the lateral side. And these are gonna be your semimembranosus and uh, semitendinosus, which are these guys here, semitendinosus and semimembranosus, which is here. And then we have on the lateral more section of our posterior compartment, all uh, right, this is the right leg here. And uh, this is gonna be our biceps femoris. And our biceps femoris has a long and a short head. The short head uh, is also innervated from your tibial nerve or else all of these guys back here are gonna be innervated by sciatic nerve. And don't worry about these guys on leg, we'll get down there. Um, and, the, and then from uh, up in our butt, we have our gluteals, our gluteus maximus, and these are gonna be controlled from superior and inferior gluteal nerves. The gluteus maximus is gonna be your inferior, where your gluteus minimus and um, medius are gonna be controlled from your um, uh, superior gluteal nerve. And that is your glute med and min, where your glute max is for your inferior glute nerve. Okay, and then on the lateral compartment, which is where our medius, we're kind of just pointing at, uh, medius is gonna be from your uh, superior gluteal nerve. Uh, the tensor fascia lata is this little guy that stretches all the way down here. Uh, is an important nerve there, also controlled from this guy. And then your uh, vastor, vastus lateralis, which you talked about from our anterior compartment, helps out a little bit on the side. And uh, all these three kind of put together, our gluteus maximus or gluteus minimus and our tensor fascia lata make up this nice long tendon. And this is called your iliotibial band. Uh, the main contributors to that are your tensor fascia lata and gluteus maximus, uh, but you do get a little bit of gluteus medius, just a very small amount in that tibial, iliotibial band. And those are important for abduction of the leg. So sciatic nerve did everything as far as flexion of the knee and extension of the leg. Remember extension of the leg is taking your leg or your hip all the way back. Um, that's your extension. That's kind of your donkey kicks or whatever. I don't know what they're called in the workouts that you do, uh, that people do. Uh, as far as uh, abduction, that's all our lateral compartment does. So tensor fascia lata, gluteus medius and minimus and slight amount for gluteus maximus, but not really gluteus maximus is important for posterior and extension of the leg. Okay, so as far as thigh compartments, this is just a nice synopsis as we slice the thigh in half, just to go over what we just talked about. Sartorius is that purple one that was the seatbelt went across. Remember it starts lateral up in the hip and goes medial down towards the knee. So we're probably more towards the knee here. And then we have our vastus muscles. So all these ones, these guys are all our kind of anterior compartment and rectus femoris up here. And then we have our medial compartments. Those are our adductors. We have our posterior ones, which are kind of the flexors at the knee. And then our extenders at the hip as well, taking your the, the donkey kicks, donkey kickers. Okay, um, and then uh, the vastus muscles and then the lateral, you see the tendons actually right here and that's gonna be for your abductors. And this is medial, this is lateral. Okay, so now that we've come through the thigh, let's go through the leg and then we're gonna make it down simply to a few things in the foot before we jump over into why is the leg important and clinical aspect. So as far as muscles of the leg, the things you should know, are that in the leg, you only have three compartments. Thigh, you had four. Leg, you have three. And foot, pretty much, you just have the top and the bottom, so two. Um, very simple. And so the muscles of the leg are very important because um, this is where you get a ton of questions, ton of questions. Leg and foot, you get tons of questions on BSE one on your exams right now, your step one, uh, and even on your step two and everything beyond, your shelf exams for internal medicine and stuff. These all come up, but it also is very commonly the same questions that come up as well. You'll see them over and over and over. You won't miss them when it comes to step one, so it's okay. So I'm trying not to freak you out, but you do need to know these, okay? So in the posterior compartment of our leg, so this is pretty much your calf, 
you know, look at your nice toned calf. And if you don't have a nice toned calf, then you do a little bit more working out. So you can get a nice toned calf and you can point to these muscles and go, ha, huh, I know them. So you have one muscle, the popliteus, and this muscle kind of reaches and stretches across the posterior knee. This is the popliteal fossa here. And what this does is it does this slight rotation. It's like a, like a four degree rotation of the knee and gets your knee out from locking. So this is a, a muscle that humans use to allow their leg to be fluidly moving every time they step and bend their knee. This is also the muscle that stops us from locking our knees for a long amount of time. And uh, it spasms and takes us out of a locked knee position. Uh, this is something that uh, horses do not have. So that allows them to actually stand, lock their knees and sleep standing up. That's something that horses can do that humans can't. Uh, not only to mention, we also flatten all our muscles of our whole body and we only have two legs. We don't have four to stabilize ourselves on. But that's uh, this popliteal's muscle. It just does a little bit of rotation. It rotates the knee just a little bit about so it allows our knee to nice smoothly rotate and smoothly bend on top of our meniscus, our knee joints there. And then we also have our tibialis posterior muscles and our flexor digitorum longus and our flexor hallucis longus. These are kind of deep muscles. And on top of those, we have a little bit more superficial. We have our soleus muscle and we have our gastrocnemius muscles. The gastrocnemius has been cut. They have two large heads of that. That's not important to know both of them. Uh, just knowing that you have two heads laid on top of this nice muscle. And if you flex your calf, you see this very large kind of fat, chunky muscle that looks sort of like this that pops out of your knee uh, or out of your calf. That's majorly your soleus muscle that comes out there. Um, and then deep to those, we have ones that kind of reach down. These are sort of your extensor and flexor of the wrist um, muscles equivalent in your arm that we have down in the hip. So these are the ankle. So these are the ones that are moving your ankle are these guys here. Um, and they're important. We'll come back to those in just a little bit when you get to the ankle. So now that we look at the other compartments, so we did our posterior compartment. Now let's go to our lateral and let's go to our anterior compartment of our leg. Now in our lateral compartment, the two that you should know are your fibularis longus and your fibularis brevis. Both of these muscles extend down on the lateral side and hook on to various parts down in our foot that allows for eversion of our foot where everything we were talking about in our posterior compartment reaches down on the medial side and yanks from here and allows for a little bit of inversion. But you can also see from here, we have one other muscle, tibialis anterior, that reaches across over to the medial side and allows for inversion as well, inversion. So the posterior compartment reaches down from the back and our tibialis anterior, specifically in the anterior compartment, reaches down uh, in the medial side and this allows uh, for inversion of the foot where everything on your lateral compartment is important for your eversion. And this is your extensor digitorum. Longus, that comes down from the anterior compartment as well, um, but that's just for your toes. So you can fan your toes and show off your pretty toenails that you just got uh, a pedicure on. Okay, so now that we're talking about um, a little bit more down at the foot, uh, I want to point out a few things. We're gonna be discussing the different nerves and blood supplies of the lower limb as we get there but I want to point out something that can be very testable, especially in lab, uh, and that is going to be your tarsal tunnel. So your tarsal tunnel is a place where we have our tibia here. Uh, we have our medial malleolus is this guy right here. We have our flexor retinaculum reach across. It's very similar to the flexor retin retinaculum at the carpal tunnel. And we have tendons that run through and muscles and we have nerves and we have artery, arteries and we have veins that run through our carpal tunnel on our wrist. But this is called your tarsal tunnel instead because it's in the foot instead of your wrist. And so the things that run through here are going to be Tom, Dick and very nervous Harry. And so this is your tibialis posterior, your digitorum longus and that's flexor your artery vein and nerve and the artery and vein are going to be your posterior tibial the nerve that runs right through there is going to be your tibial nerve 
And then lastly, an H for Harry, and that's for Holicis Longus, or Flexor Holicis Longus. So it's a very stupid thing. Tom, Dick, and very nervous Harry are the ways of remembering what everything that passes through there. And that's very nice to remember because I can say, oh, this person has a fractured hip. We see their femur is fractured in, in half, their hip is fractured, their pelvis is fractured, and we have decreased pulses in the foot, palpated, palpated on the dorsum of the foot up here. We have a little artery that runs down here. Where else can I palpate in the foot to determine if pulses have been blocked up above? And that is gonna be in my tarsal tunnel, looking for the artery that's found here, and that's my posterior tibial artery. And where is that found specifically? It's located next to all these guys that we're talking about, and Tom, Dick, and Very Nervous Harry are the way that to remember from pretty much medial to, or anterior to posterior. Okay, so now on to a little bit more exciting things. There's gonna be your lower limb arteries. And your lower limb arteries are very important to remember um, because not only is it testable on step one, uh, your BSEEs, your NBMEs, but also on your UWorld uh, practice once you get there and also on your internal medicine shelf and surgery shelves. This is very important. Plus you'll get punked from your doctor. So definitely uh, be able to refresh on this or come back to this video when you get to clinical rotations and you'll be nice and ready for being punked in the OR. So in our lower limb arteries, uh, if you can remember, we have our aorta that comes up here and it splits into our common iliacs. Our common iliacs give off our internal iliac and continue as our external iliac. Before it exits under the, uh, uh, before it continues as your external iliac to then turn into your femoral artery uh, under your inguinal ligament, which is right here, uh, it gives off some arteries and these are gonna be your um, internal uh, I'm sorry, uh, your inferior epigastric arteries. Inferior epigastrics come off of here and then go up. Remember, that's our reference point for our inguinal hernias. It also uh, gives off um, different structures that go out to the lateral thigh. So that's like lateral femurocutaneous arteries and stuff like that. But once it continues out under your inguinal canal, it becomes your femoral artery. And your femoral artery gives off two branches your superficial femoral artery that stays medial, and it gives off your deep femoral, which goes lateral. And off of your deep femoral gives off two main branches, your lateral and your medial circumflex. Why? Because we're right around the hip. Same thing as when we're up in the humerus, we did a little circumflex. Same thing happens down here, medial and lateral, go around the, the neck of the femur, and then they pierce the branches of here, um, or they pierce the branches of our neck here. And if I fracture across them all, I can lose blood supply to the head of the femur. That's very problematic. So deep femoral, then it gives off our medial and lateral. The superficial femoral continues down until it becomes some of our genicular or our knee. We're gonna be looking at that in a second. But off our deep femoral, it pretty much goes down and stops and ends. Our deep femoral gives off one other thing. This is our lateral femoral circumflex. Um, and off of lateral femoral circumflex, we have this descending branch that kind of comes down. And I'm just kind of drawing this parallel to the actual picture. That's this one right here. And the descending branch then hooks up and forms this kind of anastomosis here. So if I were to say, I have an occlusion in my superficial femoral artery, how does the knee get blood supply or how does the foot get blood supply? Well, from deep femoral, Deep femoral gives off our lateral femoral circumflex, which gives off our descending uh, branch, which then goes and hooks up here in this spot and then can continue down in the foot. Okay, that's how you answer that question there. Um, the femoral itself, once it comes down in the knee, is gonna become not only your genicular arteries, but your popliteal, because it goes in the backside. And we'll be talking about this once we get over here. This is popliteal in the back. And from our popliteal is where we branch off and uh, give off the blood supply of the leg. So the blood supply of the leg is gonna be your anterior tibial, posterior tibial, and our fibular nerve, our, our also called our peroneal nerve. And our peroneal nerve gives off different ones for our lateral compartment. Our anterior tibial is gonna to go to the anterior compartment, our posterior tibial is gonna to go to the posterior compartment, and then continue down in the foot accordingly. And let's go over to, and switch over quickly to our essentials anatomy and show you this 
Um, so you can get a little bit of three-dimensional picture uh, and understand this very quickly. So here we are on Essentials Anatomy, and we're gonna dive kind of into what comes off of our external iliac. So our external iliac, we're looking at the whole body from the side. This is the right side of the person. And our external iliac gives off a bunch of branches like our um, uh, epigastric arteries and our inferior epigastrics and stuff like that that we talked about before. But this is our external iliac. It passes under our inguinal ligament and becomes our common femoral. And our common femoral is important because it breaks off into our superficial and our deep femoral artery. Now, if we follow our deep femoral, you can see that it kind of just goes deep and ends here and supplies pretty much the musculature of the anterior compartment of the leg and pretty much the major part of the leg, actually. But our superficial femoral continues down and it isn't until the knee that it starts giving off a little bit of the genicular branches, which are these little ones in the front, and then ends up becoming our popliteal artery down here. So that's our femoral, our superficial femoral. And then from our deep, like we were talking about, up above, we have this circumflex. Here's our lateral and here's our medial circumflex. They circle around the nice femoral, uh, greater trochanters, lesser trochanters, and then give off these little rec retinacular branches um, of the femoral arteries that come up and circle up here. So imagine if I have an intracapsular fracture and you might go, what? is an intracapsular fracture. Well, here, uh, coming off of these arteries are these little retinacular branches. And these retinacular branches, if I fracture across this, I now no longer get blood supply up to the head of the femur in an adult. If they're less than eight years old, they have a blood supply that comes off of obturator that comes down, obturator, and this is less than eight years old, okay? Once you hit eight, you no longer have this obturator artery, and so these are important to maintain. If you fracture that, that's a problem, okay? You get necrosis of your, the head of your femur. So this is um, pretty much what happens at the femur, and let me go ahead and put the cartilage so you can see, um, or the ligaments so you can see, the connective tissue. So this is your capsule. And so in your capsule, you have multiple ligaments that kind of hold your hip joint, everything together. So you have your ischiofemoral. This is a very strong ligament that holds everything. It doesn't allow you to rotate um, or extend, hyperextend your knee. Uh, you also have this iliofemoral, which is also helpful for, for not allowing you to extend your knee. And then your pubofemoral, this is your weakest ligament found in here. Now, all these are kind of your capsule of your hip joint. And if you fracture intracapsular in there, you can see that that's gonna be the neck of the femur. You're gonna damage that, lose blood supply to the head, and you can have necrosis of the head. However, if you have fracture extracapsular, which means across here, greater trochanter here, lesser trochanter down here, if you fracture across here, you're not gonna really cut off that blood supply to the head, so it should be fine. But uh, as far as our, our blood supply, we also talked about our lateral and our medial circumflexing around, and then the lateral one gave off this descending branch that came down to the knee. So you can see this kind of little side detour to get down the knee blood supply. We had our superficial femoral came up here. We have our genicular branches that come off of that, but we also have this lateral descending branch of the lateral circumflex. And those kind of come down, make the knee get nice and rich and blood. You can see all these little miniature branches down here but let's talk about the popliteal. So the popliteal artery continues down here in the posterior aspect of your leg. So let's look up this guy. This is his back. So you can see the popliteal artery found right here. And the popliteal artery has tons of branches that circle around and help <coughs> are very important for your genicular, uh, pretty much your knee joint and everything getting blood supply. And you can see all these different ligaments and tendons and all sorts of things that are happening around on this knee joint it needs to get a lot of blood supply. So popliteal gives off two branches that are very important, and that's gonna be your uh, fibular artery, uh, your posterior tibial, and then your anterior tibial. Your anterior tibial is found right here. So your fibular is gonna go over to your fibula, that just controls the bone pretty much, your anterior tibial, and your posterior tibial. And then they continue down here. You see the anterior tibial broke its way through 
through this intraosseous membrane from the back, came up to the front, and is now deep in your anterior compartment. So what's that muscle it's gonna control or give blood supply to? That's your tibialis anterior and your extensor digitorum longus uh, is gonna be the one that gets that. Um, but our uh, posterior tibial artery comes down, continues, and where did we say our posterior tibial? went through, that's our tarsal tunnel. And you can see this continue down into the foot right here. So posterior tibial, it comes down into here and I can palpate it across this tarsal tunnel. That's an important pulse that I feel in someone's foot, just below your medial malleolus. Where on the other hand, I have this other artery that comes down here. The fibular continues down, does sort of like the lateral aspect and it, control, and it gives blood supply to your lateral compartment. And that's an important third blood supply here. Lastly, as we were talking about our anterior tibial, anterior tibial gave blood supply to the anterior compartment, but continues down, goes down here, and supplies this wonderful artery that here that we can palpate, and that's our dorsalis pedis. This is another pulse. This is the second pulse we usually feel. And if you look at this, dorsalis pedis is actually a very small artery, and it's very hard to palpate very commonly in most people, especially older people. It's hard to kind of feel this. So you kind of pretty much have to stick your finger right on top of the top of the foot, top of the bone, like the arch of the foot, uh, or on top of the arch of the foot, not the arch down here, but the arch on top, and that will allow you to feel this pulse. And that's pretty much the blood supply as far as arterial goes for the leg. So let's go ahead and talk about the venous of the leg. And the venous is even easier. So venous, pretty much all you need to actually remember are very few um, veins. You don't remember all these tons of different ones and stuff like that. But pretty much what you need to remember is that you have your anterior tibial veins, you have your posterior tibial veins, and then you have your great saphenous vein. And your great saphenous vein is pretty much everything that drains all that our um, femoral artery gave off, all that our posterior tibial artery gave off. And so it does pretty much everything from the medial foot, medial leg, medial thigh, all the way up. And that's your great saphenous. is a giant, giant, giant vein here. Um, and then we also have our femoral vein, which is found right here. And our femoral vein gets off branches from our genicular, which is from our knee, and our popliteal, which we can find back here. And then that comes from all our posterior things. So it's the same arteries as, as the, uh, the veins are called, except for um, we have this great saphenous vein does everything on the medial side, pretty much from your leg down all the way to your feet. And that's uh, all on the medial side. That's very important uh, venous structure is that's all you really need to know. Um, so let's go ahead and actually switch back over uh, to the lecture slides. Okay, so now that we talked about the arterial supply of the leg, let's dive in just slightly to um, the genicular anastomosis. Now, I don't want you to memorize all these names because that's horrible. Look at this. Look how many details and all these different things and having to branch and muscular arterial branch. Oh my gosh, what are you talking about? Just recognize, again, focusing on where did we get it from. For on the lateral superior side, we got our lateral circumflex descending branch. We already spoke about that. From the medial side, it's descending genicular branch. Where did that come off of? that came off a big artery that turned into popliteal down here, that's your femoral artery up here. Okay, that's where descending genicular. We also have some that circle around off of your popliteal, which is this guy here. And then we also have um, some that kind of circle back up off of your anterior tibial. Just knowing that this anastomosis hit is being hit from multiple, multiple places because the knee joint is very important and very vascular, vascular we have a lot of structures, a lot of tendons, a lot of different uh, ligaments and everything. Everything needs a lot of blood supply. Plus, we're using our knees a lot. We're walking, right? We need to kind of maintain these structures as long as possible until we hit about 55 and start getting osteoporosis or um, uh, osteoarthritis. And so those are kind of the main things I want you to understand is that you get it from above, you get it from the side, you get it from below as well. Okay. So as far as uh, vascular landmarks, you can read this. I'm not gonna kind of go over this, but these are just the areas that you can palpate those different pulses we talked about. 
everything coming back up to our iliacs, our external iliac, and then our femoral, which is our common femoral here. We have our deep femoral, which was draining everything that our deep um, was doing in the first place, uh, which is this guy. And then we have our femoral found right here. And then we have our saphenous that comes up here. Saphenous drains everything medial in the foot. And then our femoral drains everything kind of deep and posterior and laterally drains into femoral. And then uh, they all end up in common femoral, all end up in external iliac, common iliac, IVC, and back in the heart. And that's pretty much the veins that you need to really know from here. If, it, if it's anything like lateral or posterior, it goes to popliteal, and then goes to femoral, then up to common femoral. If it's anything medial, it goes to saphenous. And if it's up high, deep in the thigh, it just goes to deep femoral. And then they all end up plugging into common femoral back up. And that's it. As far as your nerves, uh, the nerves are pretty important to know. Um, really, it's more associated with their dermatomes, not necessarily like where they tract. Uh, but some of them that are kind of important, obviously our femoral nerve we talked about was our anterior compartment. So it does first motor in the anterior compartment, and then it finishes off in the leg. So it does everything kind of medial aspect of your leg, medial of your thigh and anterior thigh over here. That's our femoral. Our obturator is everything medial. So it's gonna do motor first. So innervate all these motor and then continue and do the medial thigh here, a kind of mid medial thigh. And then we have all our inguinal stuff that's gonna be controlling our upper thigh, uh, right? In our sensitive areas, right? And then we have our um, superior and inferior gluteal nerves. We already talked about what muscles, those are uh, kind of opposite. The inferior is for gluteus maximus, superior is for gluteus medius and minimus. Uh, and our tensor fascia lata. And then we have our, uh, once we get down here in the leg, right, we have the sciatic nerve that comes down. Sciatic nerve gives off our fibular and our tibial nerve, uh, which are important for everything in our leg. And our tibial nerve gives off our common fibular. Common fibular goes lateral. So you can imagine that it innervates the lateral compartment. In addition, it comes down, eventually does sensory in the foot, except for the web space. So this is our common femoral or fibular, sorry. And then our deep fibular does everything deep. So anterior compartment, it's gonna be our deep. And then it's gonna go deep and deep and deep and come out on the surface in this toe web space. So deep fibular nerve is gonna be in that one. Okay. Uh, and then we'll explain this once we get to the dermatomes as well. So here are the dermatomes. First, you have our L1 to uh, S1 pretty much breakdown, you can see these nice dermatomes layout. Um, and if I were to ask you, if I were to do a reflex hammer of my patellar tendon, which is found right here, I'd hit my L3, 4, and I'd kick the door. <laughs> so L3, 4, kick the door. And that is my patellar reflex. Okay. And if I wanted to hit my ankle right down here, uh, S1, S2, S1, S2, buckle my shoe, right? That's gonna be my Achilles reflex or ankle reflex. Okay, S1 or S2. So yes, that's super high yield. That's pretty much what you get from these dermatomes. Move on. As far as cutaneous uh, innervation, these are the things that I was talking about as far as named nerves. This is far more important for the leg than it is in, in um, than it is for the dermatomes to know, uh, but these guys are very important. Now, some of them aren't that wonderful to remember. The few that do come up are your femoral nerve. So, knowing your blue distribution here, the medial leg, medial thigh, anterior thigh, except for this one place, that obturator nerve kind of hits nice and special in this kind of medial. Uh, aspect of the leg, super random here. Remember, obturator comes in to medial thigh, ends up with sensory all the way at the end here. And then we have our uh, different nerves in our lower part or on the back, right? So this is all your green area that's labeled up here. That's your sciatic nerve. Sciatic nerve does the butt, posterior thigh, uh, lateral and lateral aspect of the foot. And then the medial was that femoral all in this area. And uh, if we were to break down the foot a little bit further, right, common peroneal was here, 
common peroneal does superficial. So com peroneal gives off superficial, then it's deep. So superficial helps out to do all this green area here. And the deep does everything right here, this little wedge of orange. And that's your deep fibular. Fibular, uh, also called peroneal. So if you ever read peroneal and you go, what the heck is that? That's also called fibular. Um, okay, so pretty much as far as uh, your lateral aspect, uh, it's nice to know that your common peroneal, which is someone gets a broken leg, a tib-fib fracture, no sensory or motor deficits, and we put a cast on them for six weeks. So we put a cast on their leg, and which puts a little bit of extra compression right here on the knee as they're bending their knee and everything like that. And this kind of pushes on this nice nerve, common peroneal, wink, wink, wink. This is your vignette on your test question. Get this question right, please do not miss it. Common peroneal, uh, I uh, damage my common peroneal, so I lose the whole dorsal sensory of my foot and lateral aspect of my foot as well. And that is going to be a very, very, very common question that comes up on pretty much every NVMe from here on out slash step one. Okay, always remember what your common fibular or all, aka common peroneal nerve does. Breaks the superficial, everything but the first web space, deep finishes off that deep web space there. Uh, and then as far as motor, it does your anterior and lateral compartments. Okay, so now onto your lower limb. Uh, lymph lymphatics. Uh, this is very important and uh, very, very easy. Okay, instead of reading all these words and looking at these circles with all these arrows, it does actually sum up what's going on. I want you to look at your leg. Okay, I want you to sit here and I want you to listen to what I'm saying. Look at your leg, okay, right now. Your leg, your knee, your foot. If you have snow pants on and you can't see your leg or knee or foot, take off your snow pants. And if you're in the top of Monica, or if you're in a building with other people, don't take off your pants, um, unless they're all watching my video and they're all doing the same thing, okay? Uh, don't be that one person in the middle of the study area to take off your pants, okay? But I want you to look at your leg and I want you to do one thing for me. I want you to touch the lateral part of your foot, okay? With your right hand. So look at your right leg, touch the lateral part of your right foot with your right hand. And then I want you to touch the back of your leg, not thigh, leg. When you touch the back of your leg, your calf muscles, okay? Your right hand on your right, uh, on your lateral part of your foot. And I want your left hand on your calf. And now if you do this, I want you to tell yourself wherever I'm touching is going to drain into my popliteal nodes. From my popliteal nodes, it goes deep to the bone all the way up to my deep inguinal nodes, period. Wherever I'm touching, it drains into my popliteal nodes, goes deep to the bone, goes up my femur to my deep inguinal nodes. Okay, if you can repeat this line and you understand what you're saying, then you can understand that everything else in your leg, every area else, except for those two places, drains to all the way up your superficial inguinal nodes, period, the end. That's all you need to know for lower limb lymphatics. Okay, Trundlenburg sign, waddling gait. Uh, waddling gait, uh, this is uh, how I remember this, is Trundlenburg sassy, sassy sign. So you got some sassy hips, see? See the sassy hips? I see sassy hips. Uh, the S of sign, because Trendelenburg test is not for this. Trendelenburg test is for venous insufficiency of the leg, and you'll learn that in year two. Don't worry about that right now. The Trendelenburg sign for S for sassy sign is your waddling sassy butt sign right here that you can see. And so what the problem is, is usually when you lift up the opposite leg, you tense and straighten up the legs that would normally abduct this leg. But since it's stable on the ground, you're gonna then instead lift up this part of your body. Okay, and so uh, these muscles that do this Right? You can actually feel them on your hips when you do this. This is your abductors, abductors. And if you go, what are your abductors of your hip? We already talked about this. Glute, med, minimus, and tensor fascia lata, TFL. Okay, but the main things that you wanna remember are your glute, mid, and minimus. And so when you damage the nerve that hits your gluteus, minimus, and 
medius, then you're gonna have this Trendelenburg sign positive when you lift this person's leg up. And so simply this, if you stand up in the room right now and you're listening to me again, and you stand up and lift up your left foot and you stand on your right and your hip doesn't fall, you're good. If you stand on your left foot and lift up your uh, right, uh, your other leg, and you're still good, then you don't have this damage. However, if you, let's say you are standing on your left foot and you lift up your right leg and your hip drops, the part that's damaged is the leg that you're standing on. So they're gonna always say like, oh, this right hip drops or whatever. And you'd be like, oh my gosh, is it opposite or the same? Just remember, whatever leg they're standing on, if the hip drops, it's the leg they're standing on, okay? And so if this person lifts up, uh, their right leg and their hip drops, what leg are they standing on? Well, if they, they lifted up the right leg, unless they're floating like Superman, they're probably standing on their left leg. And so the left leg has the problem, left hip has the problem, that's your left superior gluteal nerve. Remember inferior gluteals for gluteus maximus, but your in, uh, superior gluteal nerve is for these abductor muscles. And these abductor muscles are important for keeping your gait straight so that you don't have Trendelenburg sassy sign test positive. Okay, so hip fractures. So hip fractures, we already talked about these, so we'll go through these very quickly. Again, uh, neck of the femur is fractured, that's uh, infracapsular. That's going to damage your medial circumflex femoral artery and the retinacular branches that come off of this, okay? Medial circumflex. Because we'll just say what are the branches off of what artery? Medial circumflex, medial circumflex, okay? Who cares about lateral? Just remember medial, okay? That's important. Next is, what are the consequences? Necrosis of the femoral head, unless you are less than eight years old. Why? Because you have this obturator artery that kind of sneaks in a little blood supply when you're less than eight, okay? Um, yeah, okay. Uh, I can circle this, you know, I'll put a little winky face because, um, that's important. <clears throat> okay, so ligaments of the hip, uh, things that can be hindered, iliofemoral, strongest ligament, prevents hyperextension. You can see these kind of uh, running right here, strong. And pubofemoral limit over uh, abduction, and then ischiofemoral is that weakest down here. Okay, as far as your compartments, uh, we talked about the thigh. Uh, we talked about the nerves that are important there, tibial and sciatic for the posterior, femoral for the anterior obturator for there, and then the lateral kind of depends on which muscles we're talking about. Um, uh, and then as far as the, the leg itself, uh, like the knee moving up and down, uh, uh, we can now also have your femoral nerve important because we have some of our rectus femoris uh, muscle that lifts up our knee. That's important. But we also have certain things uh, in our leg that work on the foot as well. And so uh, in the foot, uh, we have things that do dorsiflexion, aka extension, or plantar flexion, aka flexion. Okay? Wink, wink, wink. That's going to also be on the test and try to mess you up. So don't mess it up. Okay? So your dorsiflexion. Uh, an inversion of the foot are going to be the ones that do extension. That's your anterior leg that does that. That's your deep fibular, aka peroneal nerve, and it uh, does your anterior tibial artery. Eversion of the foot, that's going to be the ones that go out. We talked about that being your lateral leg that does that. That's going to be your superficial fibular or peroneal and your fibular artery that supplies that. And then for plantar flexion, that's going to be the bottom of your foot or bringing your toes pointed. Uh, that's flexion, uh, wink, 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 wink. Uh, they really mainly get people with extension and dorsiflexion, but, and that's going to be your posterior leg. That's your tibial nerve and posterior tibial artery that supplies those muscles. Uh, and that's very important to know. Okay. Now what injuries can you get to this area? Well, there's a few that kind of do pop up in different places for different exams. Uh, for yours, you're probably going to get this unhappy triad. So what is the unhappy triad? Well, that's depicted by this guy down here. And that's going to be breaking your ATM. So breaking your bank. Uh, well, if you get to the ATM, you don't have any muscle, of course, or any muscle. What am I talking about? If you get to the ATM and you put in your card and you realize you don't have any money, you're going to be very unhappy. So your unhappy triad is a missing of your ATM. No cash. And what does ATM stand for? Is your ACL, your MCL, and your medial meniscus. 
Uh, and uh, the other way you can remember this is AMM, but uh, I don't know, this is whatever. So uh, the way that you can remember this is actually how the injury occurs. So if you get hit from the side, just like this football guy playing, you have a lot of force this way. So it cracks the medial open, the same way as you would crack open uh, an orange or something or some like pomegranate or something, right? So you put a lot of pressure on this way and it's gonna crack open this other thing. Well, what are the three ligaments that occur here? First, it's gonna be the most medial one, which is your MCL, uh, medial collateral ligament or tibia collateral ligament, okay? Uh, medial, okay? And then you also have cracking of the thing that's right just inside there between the edges of this and that's gonna be your medial meniscus. And then uh, the next one to go is going to be your ACL because it occurs from your uh, femur. It's going to be uh, medial downward. And so uh, that unhappy triad, those are the three that kind of are involved here. Please remember that uh, and know which one is kind of involved. Those, those are important. Next is going to be your housemate's knee. And that's what's uh, this picture down here. Someone that's working a very long time on their knees and they get like a swelling right under their patellar tendon where you're supposed to strike them with a hammer. And it's very painful. That's called housemaid's knee. And that's your pre-patellar bursa that's inflamed. And then next is a baker cyst. So a baker cyst is actually a swelling. This is usually found in athletes. So like uh, marathon runners or something like that. And they have the swelling in their popliteal fossa. And in their popliteal fossa, this bursa gets very swollen with synovial fluid and eventually can rupture. First, it'll be very painful back there and swollen and you poke on it. And so that's a Baker cyst. And you can find that on ultrasound or something like that. But eventually what happens is it pops and that fluid seeps down into the ankle and it ends up sitting right over your medial malleolus, just chilling down there. So if you ever see someone having a pop swollen knee and then suddenly it swells down into their medial malleolus, that's a Baker cyst rupture. And that's super common to actually find in, in athletes. And then lastly, compartment syndrome. Compartment syndrome, oh, I love compartment syndrome questions. You get so many in surgery shelf uh, for your rotation. You get, this actually does come up quite a bit when, it get, when you get to step one. But simply this, please remember this scenario. I have a 50 year old man with cardiovascular risk. He has hypertension, high cholesterol, and he's had a heart attack in the last year. Comes in and he has rapid onset within the last hour, severe lower left pain in his leg. Almost, and then you look at his leg and it's really pale and it looks like it's all mottled. It looks sort of like a lacy appearance. And so you determine that he had a clot that flew down into his leg. And you didn't do anything. You didn't have any s supplies, any medications, anything to treat him for the next six hours. Finally, you get in there, you retrieve the clot, you yank it out, blood supply starts returning the leg. Everything is good. However, a few hours later, he starts complaining of pain in his leg again. Now this time, you have to remember, once tissue starts dying, it starts filling with fluid and having inflammatory cells respond. And you might not know all this detail so far, but when you have death of tissue, what happens if someone punches you in the face? Well, first you, you get a little bruise or you know get a cut or something like that, but eventually you get swollen. Same thing, right? What happens when a bee stings you? Well, you, does your hand swell up almost instantly? Well, maybe if you have allergies to bees, yes, but for everybody else that gets stung by a bee, it doesn't swell up for a little bit amount of time because it takes a little while for the damage to occur, everything to kind of swell into the tissue. So if someone had death of this tissue because they had a blockage in the blood supply and then we re-put the blood in there, now it's just kind of start filling with fluid. And this is a problem because we only have limited space in all the compartments of our muscles. And so this starts to fill in and starts compressing our nerves and our arteries. And uh, this can cause what is known as compartment syndrome. So what do we need to do? We need to go in and do exactly what this picture is showing is pretty much slice open this leg. It's called a fasciotomy and allow for this kind of to expand and fill in some space, allowing it for it to decompress eventually and heal back up. And then we can close that back up that our cut. So compartment syndrome, compression of a nerve and artery within the body, usually in the anterior leg or shin, following someone that has blood occlusion or like trauma to the leg. Those are the two things that you see that then you think of, okay, I need to be watching out for compartment syndrome in a patient. Okay, 
So last few things that we're gonna be discussing today are some of our angles of our hips and angles of our knees. And this is a very common thing to kind of find. Um, and so the way we remember these terms are our volga and vera. And so that's our coxa volga and coxa vera. And uh, you can always remember this as the coxa ones are near your coxa. Oh wait, <clears throat> I guess that's only in guys. Um, so uh, the volga and vera apply. So uh, LG for large, so large angle is 160, normally 130. Yes, 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 that's important. And then vera um, is gonna be our lesser angle, 105. But when we get down to the knee, we add an um to this. So volgum and verum. And you might be going, oh gosh, how to remember which one is what as far as the angles. So if you can just rem uh, imagine um, a genu verum, uh, the way I remember this is I have my little motorcycle and here's my little seat on there. And I'm really bad at drawing motorcycles. Let's see this guy on a motorcycle and then handlebars, vroom, vroom, okay? so. This is him sitting on his motorcycle. And you know what sound you make when you get on a motorcycle and you turn it on? You make a vroom, vroom, right? So genu vroom is when you're sitting on a motorcycle. And look at his knees. He looks just like he's sitting on a motorcycle, kind of straddling that, right? So those are the angles of the knees, actually, what happens there. Um, and then genu valgum. Uh, is the opposite when you have kind of your knees hitting together. As you can see from Valgum and Verum, uh, that's happening in this guy dancing down here in the bottom left hand corner. So this is, uh, I can't remember what this is called, but the squeaky dance or something like that. Um, but they have this contest of Valgum and Verum stress on the knee. Okay, very last things that we're gonna be discussing. Since we've covered all our blood supply, our nerves, our venous drainage, our lymph drainage, our muscles of an area, and some of the different pathologies. Let's talk about, lastly, the congenital de defects of our lower extremities. Now, some of these do occur in our upper extremities, such as sin and polydactyly. However, some of them can occur in our lower legs as well, such as congenital club foot um, and cleft hand and foot, our lobster claws and uh, things like amelia or miromelia. So that's when uh, patients are missing, or babies are born without limbs. And this is due to a congenital um, disruption. And uh, focomelia is another one on there that you can write. So focomelia means no limb. And so focomelia, uh, these all occur usually due to thalidomide poisoning, which is a um, anti-nausea medicine that used to be given to pregnant women and then whoops it ended up causing babies to be born without limbs um, determined that that drug was uh, teratogenic and then lastly other things that can mess up our lower limbs are achondroplasia that is a genetic defect in FGFR3 in the chromosome 4 um, you will learn all about this in year 2 so don't worry about it too much as far as the genes go just know that achondroplasia is our, our little play people these are uh, what is most or a long time ago used to be called dwarves or midgets um, now politically correct just calling them little people um, it doesn't matter they have achondroplasia um, and this is pretty much a faulty or over expression of this protein that tells the growth plates to pretty much close off um, very rapidly and so that's pretty much all our problems as far as um, our lower limb defects or in a little bit of our upper limb defects as well. Uh, it's not really that important to know these guys, just be familiar and go, oh, okay, uh, these do remind me of, you know, when you see this occurring, just be recognizing that this uh, does occur quite a lot. You don't need to necessarily know, um, you know, what are each of the little miniature defects that occur with each of them. Um, that's not that important uh, as far as your exams at this point. So thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe. I know lower limb is definitely not the most exciting of areas. So hopefully you were able to actually double speed this um, and get through it. Um, as far as anatomy goes, you're gonna be jumping into cardiopulmonary. Pulmonary is not really anatomy, it's more physiology related. But the cardio system has some cool anatomy um, and definitely some cool embryology that comes into play. And then when you get to term two, you're going to get to learn some of the abdominal structures and the wonderful, wonderful anatomy 
of, uh, of that in addition to your head and neck anatomy. So hopefully this was helpful. Good luck on your MSK exams. And uh, don't forget to subscribe again and check out our Facebook page, CK Med, if you would like this PowerPoint. All right, happy studying.